Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Kevin Tan, and I'm your moderator for today. And on behalf of the Singapore Heritage Society and the National Library, let me welcome you to this afternoon's presentation by uh, Associate Professor uh, Dr. John Mixick uh, on Raffles Archaeology and the British in Indonesia. Uh, for many of us here, I think John needs very little introduction, but I will nonetheless uh, do a bit of an introduction for John. Uh, John has been uh, is currently the head of the archaeology unit at the Landa Sri Vijaya Center uh, at the Institute of Southeast Asian Studies and also is associate professor at the Department of Southeast Asian Studies at the National University of Singapore. Uh, as a young student, he um, joined archaeological expeditions in northern Canada and Honduras. But in the last 40 years, he has been based primarily in Southeast Asia and has conducted some of the most important archaeological and historical investigations in Singapore, Malaysia, Thailand, Indonesia, Burma, and Cambodia. Um, he has conducted excavations of uh, some 15 sites in Singapore, uh, bringing to light details of 14th century life in early Singapore. He's also a very widely published author, uh, being the author of uh, Forbidden Hill of Singapore, Excavations at Fort Kenning, Borobudo, Golden Tales of the Buddhas, All Javanese Gold, Earthen Way in Southeast Asia, Early Singapore, 1300 to 1819, Evidence in Maps, Texts and Artifacts, and the Historical Dictionary of Ancient Southeast Asia. So, without much more ado, let me turn the floor over to John and for his presentation on Raffles Archaeology and the British in Indonesia. John. Thank you very much, Kevin, and I'm going to use two microphones here to hope there's no echo in case I walk around because i got a portable up here, too. So I thank you all for coming out on a Saturday afternoon. It's always been a wonderful thing for me to see what an important part in Singapore society the National Library plays. I think it's really unique among any of the societies I've lived in to see how the library here is involved in so many aspects of everyday life besides just a, a place to store books. Uh, now this has been a talk in a way I've been wanting to give for a very long time. And this is the first opportunity I've had to talk about something related to the history of archaeology rather than just archaeology itself, and especially Raffles, because uh, I lived in some of the more unusual places where he used to live. When I came with the Peace Corps, I actually lived in Kedah and Penang for two years. Uh, of course, I lived in um, Jol, Jakarta, where he visited several times. I've never lived in Jakarta, but I also lived in Mokulin for two years, and very few people can make that statement. And so, of course, the National Library used to be right off the Mokulin Street. And very few people here really know why there's a Mokulin Street or where Mokulin was. So I had the uh, opportunity and also the uh, experience of being in one of the more unusual parts of Southeast Asia for a couple of years. And uh, so, uh, in the way I've been kind of charting Raffles' footsteps as I traveled around. And of course, um, there have been a couple of recent books. Raffles has always been a very fascinating figure for a lot of people. And uh, most of the books tend to be rather hagiographic in their approach. There's a recent book out, of course, about Raffles and the Invasion of Java, which takes the opposite um, of view. Uh, in general, he's a very complex person. And uh, it's difficult to even though he left us a lot of his uh, inner voice in terms of his huge volumes of letters that he wrote, many of which are on display right now and have been preserved in various sources, published by his uh, widow and so on, but still, he had so many facets, um, it was difficult to get a handle on him. And uh, that's true of most very interesting men who actually lived a rather active life, even though it was relatively short in his case. Still, he did a lot of things, he saw a lot of things, and he was a, in the midst of a lot of actions. He wasn't just an administrator, but he did a lot of exploration. He involved himself in all kinds of issues, and for that alone, we should uh, pay attention to him because he was a very unique person of his time. So, I want to talk about uh, Raffles and archaeology and the British in Indonesia because of my experience in the So, I'm going to talk a bit first about what Raffles did for archaeology, and then we're going to talk a bit about what we can learn of Raffles through archaeology. And uh, 
So, of course, uh, starting off with his life history, of course, he was born on a ship in the West Indies at the age of uh, 14 already. Uh, he joined the East India Company. Ten years later, he ended up uh, arriving in Penang. And there's been some dispute over how good his Malay was, but uh, my impression is that it was pretty good already by the time he arrived. He had six months to study Malay on the ship. He had Marsden's uh, grammar of Malay and uh, dictionary in which to do it. And he was a very assiduous student of things, Malay in particular. And so uh, I believe that he actually did have a pretty good command of Malay. Um, he became a translator almost immediately, so he, he stood out already from his peers in the East India Company because even though he had not uh, been in uh, the Malay area for a long time, within a few years his confidence was already pretty high. In 1808, of course, he spent some months in Malacca as a guest of William Farquhar, with whom his fate was intertwined quite closely for the next 15 years, including in Singapore, of course. And uh, so he would have seen things like uh, the old gateway, of course, at that time, the wall, most of the wall still stood around St. Paul's Hill, um, um, the Afamosa um, Fort, not just the Fort Santiago, which is all the stuff there. And of course, he would have seen things like so-called Hung Po's Well, the tombs of the Hung Makir, Hung Makir, and so on. And probably he would have seen the stone carving, which is now in the Stott House Museum there in Malacca. Many of you, I'm sure, have seen it. And of course, it's a pretty Islamic sculpture which is a kind of makara, it's a mythical monster which has uh, aspects of both a lion and a whale and uh, an elephant's trunk and so forth. He doesn't mention many of those things in, in his uh, remarks, but he would have seen all this. He would have been already exposed to some of the early uh, archaeological remains of the um, Malacca, the Malay Peninsula region. But he worked with a lot of important people. He didn't do all this work himself. One thing he was obviously good at as most archaeologists have to be, is they have to manage teams of people. An archaeologist is not a specialist in anything. An archaeologist has to make use of many different specialities, has to be able to tap lots of different experts and put their expertise to work to create an overall story, an overall kind of a, a moral, how we got to be what we are. And uh, one of the important people he worked with was a Colonel McKenzie. He was from the Madras Engineers. Um, and for 11 years, he was surveying Mysore, one of the major East India Company possessions in India. And uh, so from there, in 1811, he was brought over to be the engineer in charge of the British landing on Java. Of course, for those of you who don't know why they were invading Java, that's because at this time, France and Napoleon were occupying the Netherlands. And the, the, the Dutch royal family had fled into exile in London and they had asked the British to take over all the Netherlands' possessions to prevent them from being used by the French to support their wars in Europe. So there was already kind of a global conflict in the early 19th century, which involved the Singapore area, including the Dutch possessions in Java and Sumatra, various other parts of Indonesia. But the local Dutch, on the other hand, had a very different attitude toward the British. They saw them as their competitors, not their allies, and a lot of them had already made some kind of accommodation with the French, and so they were not particularly supportive of the British invasion, and a lot of them actively opposed it. So there had to be uh, a fairly well thought out approach to landing, um, and of course they landed in both the west, uh, west coast of Java, around Montan, and also in the Jakarta area. And uh, so it took a good engineer to work all those uh, things out. I identified the statue, which is guidance called Loro Jongra the Slender Maiden, and it's still the name by which the Japanese call the temple today. Because of the statue, um, the, he identified the statue as Parvati or Durga, so he was right on there. And the demon in the same sculpture, who he, she's pulling out by the hair from the buffalo, is Mahishasura, or Vashasura, so he was correct there. He knew a fair amount already about Hindu iconography. And he noted that it was still being presented with uh, offerings, even though the Javanese had long been food of um, Islam, Islamic by this time. And he mentions finding a well, some kind of a hole in front of the statue, which has long been covered up. One would normally assume this was a looter's pit. But he notes that in India, there's often, often a well in front of the statue of Durga, something I've never been able to actually trace down and find out just what he's referring to here.
In the next chapel, he found Ganesha again, identifying him correctly, although his guys called him Gajamada, which of course is Gaja, uh, his elephant, Mada Gajamada, who was the Javanese prime minister of the 14th century. But it also does mean elephant who is running in the state of rut. So <laughs> they have none of their meaning as well, this particular statue. And he also found this uh, statue in the, the lower right here, which is in the south uh, chapel. Um, uh, but he couldn't uh, recognize him. He, uh, Augustia is one of these figures who was present in Indian iconography, but he's not really a god. He was seen as a great teacher who brought uh, Brahmanical Sanskritic Hindus into South India. Um, but in Java, he became a deity closely associated with Shiva, so it's not surprising that Mackenzie couldn't recognize him. This was something that's a, more of a Javanese adaptation of Indian uh, religion. He didn't manage to get into the East Chamber, unfortunately, which is where the big Shiva statue is. He also found inscriptions left by other engineers and surveyors who had already visited them, uh, the site, some of whom he knew, so a bunch of the, the Dutch were carving the names on the walls at this time. Other statues in the era, he knew were either Buddhist or giant, he couldn't make up his mind because he couldn't tell the difference. But he recognized the monkeys as references to Hanuman and the Ramayana. So these are some of Mackenzie's drawings of the Ramayana release with the monkeys. And uh, that's what it looks like. So he was uh, pretty accurate in his drawing of this particular one. It's not a Bakma statue. And this is his uh, later uh, depiction. So he later on, he did get into the East uh, Chamber, saw Shiva, made a drawing of him. And that's the Kajamada or the uh, Ganesha from the south, again, not 100% accurate, but good enough for a, for a rapid sketch. And uh, now Mackenzie Mac already had a fair degree of experience in exploring remains in India. This is a giant Nandi statue, um, which he had his draftsman draw for him. And Mackenzie actually discovered one very important Buddhist site we now know is one of the earliest Buddhist sites in South India, Amaravati. Um, and then this is a, up at the upper left. This is a, these are on the upper left and the right. These are various other drawings of reliefs and uh, structures in this same area. Uh, the one on the top is by Cor um, uh, Cornelius, the Dutch. Um, the, the picture at the upper right, this is the way Carmona looked after all the vegetation was cleared off it in the late 19th century. So that's more or less what Mackenzie saw. Plus, it was clearly covered with all these various kinds of trees and so on. In later periods, these ruins became the subject for a lot of European artworks of various types, some of which was much more emotional and that it was descriptive, such as this drawing of um, Krambanan by Seaburg in the 1840s. This is how the, the area actually looked after it began to be restored in the early 20th century. So now Krambanan lay right next to the main road between the north coast, Smarang, through Solo going on to the Jogja Palace. So that one was seen and referred to by lots and lots of people. So it's not surprising that the British paid a lot of attention to it. This is how it looks today. It has been restored in the late uh, 20th and uh, early 21st century. Mackenzie and his party were carried around on sedan chairs to Chandi Sengu, a thousand temples right nearby. It's only a kilometer away. Which again, he gave credit to the Dutch for having recorded this in 1807. And he described these giant statues of the door guardians, or Dwarapala, which he called porters, or watchmen. And other statues he called giant because of their want of dress, as he said. In other words, they look like almost they're naked. And many of the statues were already headless at that time, so this is not a recent like a, a kind of iconoclasm, or even lots of the heads had been stolen from the statues for almost 200 years ago. Actually, it is 200 years ago. And this is a drawing that, uh, that Cornelius had made in 1807.